Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Philip Koopman. Uh, Phil is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and one of the world's experts on autonomous vehicle safety. Phil, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me back, Spencer. Thanks for coming back on. So you've written a bunch of papers lately on sort of getting at the definition of safety as it pertains to autonomy. Uh, do you want to talk about that a bit? I've been doing definitions for safety for a while. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> now, now, before your listeners go, oh, my God, he's going to talk about terminology. Uh, that's not what this discussion is about. OK, <laughs> it's not that's not that discussion. Uh, but it turns out that when you make something autonomous, that there's no immediate human operator, it fundamentally changes what you mean by safety in ways that go far beyond the is it safer than the human driver? And so I think it would be interesting for us to sort of discuss that whole topic. Sure. Yeah, no, that sounds great. What set you down this road uh, this time around as opposed to some of the other you know, work you've done in the area? Like what, what sets this apart? Well, the original work was when I was working on the UL4600, which is an autonomous vehicle safety standard. Uh, we quickly said, all right, we have to have a definition for safe. And that's based on safety cases. So instead of trying to invent something new, looked at the literature, looked at the other standards, came up with the definition of safe and safety case. Uh, and those are mostly, well, you need to make sure that it mitigates risk uh, for a given operational environment. I'm doing the short, non-technical version Okay, here. so I think if I'm understanding correctly, the idea is if you were to take this new definition and put it through the existing standards and follow that definition of safe, then you'd have a safer standard? Well, to use the word safe too many times yeah, in a row. You, what, what you would get is right now, if you ask someone uh, who's into this stuff, what does safe mean? You get an answer that sounds a lot like a variation on, well, we're going to mitigate the risks and we're going to do that within an established operational environment. Uh, and there are two problems. So as I've dug into this, I wrote the Safe Enough book. And then when I was done with that book, I immediately realized there's a bunch of other stuff outside the scope of the book that also matters. Uh, and it breaks both of the mitigating risk. Turns out that doesn't actually get you safety. Uh, everyone thought that. It's not really true. And the, uh, the intended operational environment, turns out, that doesn't work either. And what brought this to a fore for me was all the, the craziness we've seen in San Francisco with all these robo-taxis getting caught on all these videos and all these pictures doing crazy stuff. And people came to realize, for example, well, running through an emergency scene and running over charged fire hoses and getting between a firefighter and a burning vehicle and just parking between them, that's not the type of stuff you usually see in a list of hazards, uh, but it kind of matters. Or running through a, con a, clo a closed road construction zone, whether you get stuck in the wet concrete or not, just driving around inside a construction zone that's supposed to be a closed road presents some hazards to everyone involved. But these aren't the kind of things you typically see in a safety uh, discussion, which are more about crashes, right? That makes a lot and, of sense. Those are good corner cases. Yeah, well, but they're not, they're not weird corner cases. This stuff was, there were dozens of reports of all sorts of craziness in San Francisco, or even just stopping in the middle of the road so people say well i mean from the robotics community the big red button is your first is your go-to right you know you do you do the e-stop you do the shutdown but if you shut down the middle of the street and five minutes later a fire truck or ambulance needs to get through oh all of a sudden that is sort of a safety issue right oh that's interesting yeah that makes sense to yeah. me and and that was happening in san francisco a bunch of times and so the the discussion of safe has to be broader than do we have an e-stop on this thing, an emergency stop that shuts it down, which is tactically safe and narrowly safe uh, for, for some equipment? I mean, if you're going 60 miles an hour, locking up the wheels is also not a, bad, also not a great idea. But, but I'm going way beyond that and saying even if you successfully bring your 
robot your car or whatever to a tactically safe state for the moment, it turns out that's not everything you need for safety, uh, especially when you're operating in an open world, you're part of a complex social technical system with all these other road users. And, and it just got me thinking about, well, you know, it, it feels like these robo taxis, but more generally autonomous systems are sort of breaking all these baked in assumptions and what we thought were safe. Uh, and, and again, which boils down to reducing risk, uh, you know, under under specified operating environment. Well, reducing risk. Well, what do you mean by reducing risk and risk to who? And some of these things aren't really necessarily even risk to these other constraints. Uh, and part of the challenge of robo taxis is we don't understand the environment. So if you say safety only counts in a defined environment, well. If the defined if the environment is unexpected, does that mean it's okay to go crazy? No, it doesn't, right? Uh, yeah. So, so well, now, so now we've completely broken the definition of safety, and it all traces back to removing a human operator. So that that's kind of the starting point. That's how I got there. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for setting that context, Phil. Okay, so what what happens next? You're you know, it's like, well, so what am I going to do about it? Well. I did some, I work with a law professor on some of my uh, papers. I have at this point two law journal papers. I thought my lifetime sum would be zero, but it turns out I was wrong about that <laughs> as a computer guy. Like, Sometimes really life has other plans. <laughs> law journal paper, okay, but you know, here I am. That's where we ended up. Uh, and he got to, so, so uh, uh, Bill Wyden is my, my co author, he's a law professor in Miami. Uh, and, and he comes from a completely different background, of course, right? But he helped me think a little more broadly about some things like um, public, well, you could do harm to public safety, or what about liability? I learned more about liability than I ever expected I would. Uh, and, and it turns out that for all practical purposes, these are safety constraints as well. Uh, and so the question is, what do you actually mean by safe? And what engineers love to mean by safe is, well, we're reducing the risk of a bad event. Uh, and then I dealt with some insurance folks, and it turns out that risk actually doesn't isn't the same as safety. People always say, absence of unreasonable risk, this is what the federal government uses for safety. Well, you can get rid of unreasonable risk and still be unsafe. Oh, that's interesting. What does that okay. look like, like by example? Well, I'll give you I'll give you an I'll give you a real world example from my personal life. Okay, um, you can buy insurance for all sorts of things. Okay, so uh, I had insurance when I was driving submarines for a living that would pay out for life insurance if I was killed in combat. I did not know they sold insurance for that, but that makes sense. Yes, US, USA. Any military officer knows who USA is. That that was my insurance company, and they do life insurance. I bank with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. And and they they ran this article that one of their precursors, you know, paid out on General Custer. Seriously. And General a Custer. Of, yeah, that General Custer would he was killed. <laughs> they paid out his life insurance policy and there's a copy of his life, you know, okay. So, so this is not a new thing. This has been around for a long time. Uh, because doing something you can buy insurance for doesn't make it safe. In, a, in an objective sense. What it makes it is oh, that's a predictable risk and they can charge enough premium to cover the payout. That makes sense. Okay. Amortized over the number of troops, you know yeah. X number are probably gonna die in combat, so therefore you right. set your risk and, reasonable, yeah. And it's not just the military because you can get uh, you can get insurance for um, uh, commercial spacecraft launch. Oh, uh, they buy they buy insurance for tankers and and I remember during one of the Gulf Wars reading about the insurance rate spiked upward for tankers going through you know the Gulf because because makes sense you know, they were getting shot at right <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and if, so it isn't it isn't about being able to buy insurance isn't about being safe it's about having a predictable risk that you can afford to buy insurance for and motorcycles motorcycles are dramatically more dangerous than cars. And I'm not making a value judgment here. I'm just telling you what this, the, no, the my, statistics say. It's just the stats. My okay? dad was a surgeon with a motorcycle injury practice when I was a kid, and he would tell me about some of the injuries he saw. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. And, but but it isn't about the one-off stories. It's about just look at the numbers, and it's a lot more hazardous to, to drive a motorcycle. It's just, just the number. And if you want to do that, that's fine. You can get insurance for that. Doesn't mean it's as safe as driving in an up-armored SUV, you know, <laughs> with all the airbags and stuff. Uh, and so, so the point here is that risk tends to drive towards a monetization of the losses, 
We don't like to think of it that way, but it all, and that's what insurance is all about, right? Yeah, it okay? makes sense. And so if you reduce the risk, you're, you're in most cases reducing the expected economic loss is what it boils down to, right? And, and that drives you towards being safer than not. If you're egregiously unsafe, in fact, your insurance will be so high you can't afford it. But there are <laughs> lots of things that, that if, you, if you're yeah, sort of in the zip code is safe, but not really safe, and you can afford the insurance. So if you, if you want to buy a car that's prone to crashing, now I'm going to say something hypothetical. It's important that it's hypothetical. Let's say there's a car that kills twice as many people in the car as every other car. Okay, um, and you can afford the insurance. You can buy the car. Doesn't make it a safe car. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. Okay. So, so. But in insurance... theory, it's twice as expensive to insure or some other similar multiple or, wh- or whatever, whatever the number yeah. is. Hypothetical. But, but you know, if it's two hundred instead of one hundred, and, yeah. and you're making a bazillion dollars, what do you care, right? <laughs> you <laughs> you want to drive the fancy toy, oh, you know. Yeah. Um, and and so. Saying we're going to reduce risk, or we're not going to have unreasonable risk, we're not going to have crazy risk, certainly pushes you towards safety, but it doesn't actually get you there. Okay, so that's part one. Uh, and, and people are that people, I'm going to say a lot of things during this discussion that people are like, no, that's not how I think about it. Well, that's the point of the discussion. Okay. Um, the next thing is people like to say, well, it's going to be safer than a human. So, of course, that will be acceptable socially. Uh, and that's that's definitely not correct. Now, of a self-driving all, car, yeah. So yeah, I have a robot taxi. It's safer than a human. What do you want from us, right? And all the companies, so the the Waymo reports and the Cruise reports have all been saying, here's a baseline driver. Defining the baseline is hard. I think we talked about that last episode, so I'm not going to. Yeah, go I believe so. It. But but you know, we're we're safer than a than a human driver, whatever human driver we picked. So that means we're safe. Uh, and what we saw in San Francisco with some of this robotaxi behavior, in particular, that tragic pedestrian dragging uh, in- incident, right. is that there are aspects to safety that are not there. Uh, and one of them, let me go down sort of a simple example, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to go to negligence, but it, it's, it, it's important for people to understand this because it's going to change how all robots have to be built. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. The simple example is, again, hypothetical. To be clear, I said the word hypothetical. Let's say there's a robotaxi that kills half as many people. So you're from ball, and, and every car on the road is this design, just to make it simple, as a thought experiment, okay? Sure. So the U.S. goes from ballpark 40,000 deaths a year on roads to 20,000. Now, everyone would say, that sounds safer, right? Sure. Yeah, well, I could buy that premise. Yeah, okay. Every, I mean, people would be delighted. I'd be delighted if that happened. But what if this is the hy- – first of all, that one's hypothetical. We don't know if that will happen. But the second hypothetical is what if every single one of those 20,000 deaths is pedestrian, which is way more than pedestrian deaths we have today? Oh, that's interesting, as opposed to like some of those were driver deaths or passenger deaths. Yeah, every right. single one's a pedestrian death. That's going to be a problem socially, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because the pedestrian didn't consent to be part of the, yeah. Well, A, and more of them are dying, right? Yeah, yeah, for uh, sure. And so, so if it's a small, if it's a 1% or 2%, yeah, maybe. But, it, you know, if you get some dramatic change in the distribution of who's suffering the harm. But but I use pedestrian deaths because they're not the ones actually benefiting from the self-driving. from the yeah. They're not the ones riding, getting getting the robo taxi rides cheaper, but they're paying this uh, dramatically increased cost compared to what we have today. Yeah. Okay. So so that's and, and you know it's hard to put a number. I can't tell you what the number is. I can just tell you something that dramatic is going to be a problem. And so the argument is you can't simply ignore that redistributing risk on a vulnerable populations is a concern. You can't ignore that. And so if you want to be safer, you have to say not only is net safety better, or at least no worse, even no worse might be okay, right? Because you're getting some other utility from this. Uh, but uh, you're going to have a problem if you redistribute, redistribute risk onto vulnerable populations. You know, oh, if you yeah, really, if you didn't buy me so far, what if all 20,000 are kids in crosswalks on the way to school? 
Oh, <laughs> I see what you're saying. You know, at some point, you have to admit yeah. that that's well, not going to be okay. I right? mean, to be fair, you had me at pedestrians, but yeah, yeah I, I see. But what I, you're I'm, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> making this as pointed as I can. Yeah. And the point is not that that will happen. You know, I, kids I in wheelchairs. <laughs> well, well, you know, yeah. go as far as you want. At some point, you yeah. have to admit it's going to be a problem if there's yeah. a very targeted demographic paying the entire price for all road deaths. It's not going to work out. Yeah. But that is, you know, it isn't. I'm not saying that will happen. Of course, I'm not saying that. My point is that. Another consideration is not just the total number of deaths, but there's going to be, if you have an aberrant distribution of who's paying the price, and especially if it's a vulnerable population, that's not going to be acceptable. It's a constraint on safety. That's interesting. Yeah, I would not have thought of that. Uh, well, it that's sounds what like I it took you a long time lawyer. to yeah, that's exactly. what I hang out with lawyers. <laughs> I got it. Believe it or not, I get insight. All right. All right. So now yeah. let me do the the next one. This, that's a ramp up to the lawyer thing. And sure. I apologize it's lawyer thing, but but this is going to affect the life of everyone making an autonomous system. They're going to have to deal with this. So let's get it out on the table. There's this thing called liability and tort law. And, and I know engineers are very disdainful of tort lawyers. And there's that derogatory term ambulance chaser and that whole and the the uh, <clears throat> nuclear verdicts, they call it, you know, oh, my goodness, this is a $10 million verdict. Well, turns out U.S. Department of Transportation values human life at $12.5 million. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah, For that's personal. right on the website, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's that's how much they're willing to spend on, on road improvements to avoid a death. So that sounds like a big number, but it's actually very justifiable, okay? So yeah. so we're going to go into that whole, ter whole ter territory, but I, I promise not to make it pedantic, okay? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm a professor, but I'll do my best. Okay. So, so the idea is when you go on the road, you have a duty of care to the other road users. And this is the legal phrasing. Duty of care is the legal phrasing for you're not supposed to run over other people on purpose, right? I mean, it's hard to argue with that one. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I can. But you're also supposed to not do stupid things that would be likely to have you run somebody over. So this is why if you're staring at your cell phone texting and you run someone over, you've got a big problem because that's negligent behavior. Yeah, it makes you sense. You failed to satisfy your duty of care. And, and, and the, um, the standard is called a reasonable person. Reasonable man is the language, but it's reasonable person. You, yeah. you have to be a reasonable person in your behavior. And if you're not reasonable, then you're negligent. Okay, So a reasonable person is not supposed to be staring at their cell phone while their car is going down the road. Yeah, it makes sense. That. Now, it's engineer. this drives engineers crazy because there is no... Um, formal specification for what it means to be reasonable. Yeah, I however, can see that. <laughs> yeah, however, the the legal community considers it an objective standard. Interesting. That surprised me. It's an objective standard. What reasonable human driver is an objective standard. But the way you specify it is not using math or or engineering numbers. The way you specify it is the aggregate outcome of jury trials. Oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. And if if on you know if they tend to be repeatable, then it must be an objective standard, right? Even if you can't explain if jury now, now, jury has found enough people guilty for doing that thing, it's therefore if, considered unreasonable if, to do that yeah. thing. Okay. Now I'm being I'm for the lawyers listening. Sorry, I'm just be, I'm oversimplifying to connect with engineers. Okay. And so, I'm just trying to get it. Your, so I'm restating. If you're a lawyer, you can do your own <laughs> podcast. I don't even that engineers. I'm just trying to communicate with engineers. But, Send all hate you know, mail. If, <laughs> if, if you have a hundred juries that all say look looking at your your cell phone and you hit someone and that's negligence, I'm going to say jury 101 is probably going to say the same thing, right? There's some statistical aspect to this, but that's the idea. Now, people, oh, the, the self-driving folks I talked to initially really hate this idea because they don't know how to write it as a software spec, right? And I'm, I'm going to point out the irony to a bunch of people who are using machine learning complaining that the only specification is defined by example. <laughs> Fair enough. How's that? I think it's correct. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Um, uh, so turn machine learning loose on all the, the corpus of case law. Have fun with that. I, I, I actually, that may be the only way to solve this, but um, you know, we're just having fun here in this discussion. Uh, so there's this thing called the duty of care, which is an objective standard. Uh, now that you understand why I say that, right? And uh, all human drivers have that. Right now in U.S. law, Computer drivers. Okay. Just to make sure I'm following, Go you're ahead. considered yeah. negligent if you fall outside of your duty of care. Uh, yeah, negligence is a failure to to adhere to your duty of care. Okay, understood. So you, if you behave in a way 
contrary to your duty of care, you're negligent. Then you're negligent. That's what negligence is. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that, Phil. Yeah. I'm, I've spent so many hours with lawyers that I might as well <laughs> try and get this stuff straight. Yep. Okay. Uh, so with me so far, so negligence is you're not upholding your duty of care. Roger. Now, that. human drivers have, uh, are not allowed to, human beings are not allowed to be negligent anywhere, right? But it isn't just that you behave negligently. The negligence has to actually lead to a loss or it's not actionable. Yeah, it makes okay. sense. So if you don't, you know, if you, if you drive like a maniac and no one else is on the road, there's no one to sue you, right? Because no, you didn't hurt anyone. What's the sound of okay. one hand clapping? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now, now. What if you're wrong and there is someone in the road you didn't notice them? Now you got a problem, right? So serious one so, at that. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason you should not now there's another piece to this. The reason you should not run red lights is if you run a red light, that's a traffic violation. If you run a red light and hurt someone, that's negligence. There's a thing called negligence per se, which is if you violate a road rule and that results in harm, approximately results in harm to another person, that's negligence per se. And the duty is on you to prove you weren't negligent. Okay, a truck pushed me through the red light from behind. Okay, fine. Yeah, that wasn't negligence perhaps, right? But but setting aside the weird exceptional kind of circumstances, if you run a, if you disobey a traffic law and you hurt someone, you're going to be negligent per se. And not only do you have a criminal issue, but you have the the wrongful death or the wrongful harm. You have the civil suit looking at you too because of negligence. Yeah, fair. your throttle locks open and you can't do anything about it, you know, like through And that's different fault. unless you didn't maintain your car, right? You know, it gets complicated. Yeah. But, but you know, is did, were you behaving as a reasonable person all the way through? Yes, then it's not negligence, it's some other thing. Uh, I mean, somebody somebody still has to pay for the per to help the person get better. Or maybe it's the car company that's at fault rather than the individual uh, who's yeah. driving the or, car. Or you know, or maybe sometimes it just stuff happens. I get that, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I'm not saying self-driving cars have to be perfect. But one of the constraints on self-driving cars is they should not behave in a negligent way. Oh, that's okay. interesting. So, yeah. And so so the the example I'm going to use, and we're going to, I have to come back to the current law. But example I'll use is, let's say you've decided you will have safer net outcomes if you roll through stop signs, which Tesla actually programmed that in. There was a recall over this. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. I so hypothetically... That. You, you, so it's easy to argue that this might be the case, right? Um, let's say that if you roll through stop signs at five miles an hour, which is what Tesla was doing, okay, which is sound, that's almost, that's like a, a fast trot. I mean, that's way faster than walking, right? But let's say you have a ton of data that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that rolling through stop signs at five miles an hour reduces rear end collisions of people who also want to roll and, and you reduce crashes on the road. Okay. That's what their justification was for that. Let, let, let's just, that's hypothetical. They didn't that's have right. that justification. They just decided they wanted to do that. Okay. But that's let's say right. someone could prove that rolling through stop signs reduced crashes objectively. They could absolutely prove that. Okay. But um, to do that, you have to say, but there's nobody around. Well, what if there's a pedestrian around that they didn't see? The computer vision just didn't see the pedestrian and they hit and killed the pedestrian. Now they've got a problem because they broke a traffic rule and they resulted in harm, and that's negligent driving. Oh, that's interesting. So, so who's so the considered fact negligent? So reducing the crashes, but you're behaving by breaking a road rule does not excuse you. You can't say, let me, again, this is hypothetical. I'm, I'm doing it for effect to make the point. Sure. I drove a bazillion miles. I've never had a traffic ticket. Does that give me a free kill? <laughs> Of course it does. No, I'm just kidding. Kidding. Oh, that was sarcasm for yeah. those listeners who are sarcasm impaired. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a no. reason I didn't say it. A absolutely <laughs> not. Yeah, yeah, I agree no, with you. No, the answer is it does not, right? And so <laughs> one of the interesting things about um, negligence is that good behavior speaks to the punishment, but it does. it's not an excuse for having done the negligent behavior. That makes a lot of sense. So even if you can reduce outcomes through a traffic violation, you shouldn't do it because in the instances that an accident's caused on the tail end of that traction vi traffic violation, you're negligent. You're negligent, right. And so so uh, a finding of negligence is based on the behavior and statistical safety. So it sounds like you're negligent not even a if an accident isn't caused, but like the times yeah. the accident is caused, the negligence people care about. Yeah. And yeah. people say, well, I, you know, this avoided a bazillion crashes, right? Yeah, good for you. 
but you still ran a stop sign and killed this guy, and that doesn't get you off the hook. Yeah. You know, now you're looking at negligent homicide or whatever the legal term is in the state you happen to live in, right? How do those cases end up where there's a company that's considered negligent or a self-driving? Well, okay, that's the question. Yeah. There's been one Tesla case where uh, a, uh, someone on autopilot um, uh, came off a freeway onto a city street, still on autopilot, ran a red light, killed two people. And that was a criminal case, and he eventually copped a plea, but, but that was a negligent homicide. A, again, for the lawyers, there's specific terms. On the part of the paid. driver or on the part of yeah, Tesla? Yeah, on the part of the driver. On the part oh, of the driver. That's interesting. And Tesla, Tesla, Tesla completely got off the hook because they just blamed the driver. How did the driver get blamed for that, though? I mean, they. Well, he should have been paying attention to autopilot. He should oh. have intervened and avoided the crash because autopilot says you should remain attentive. Now, we all know that that's hard to do. People. That's the other podcast, right? So <laughs> that's the other episode. Right. But yeah, you know, so there's another one that just happened, another similar criminal case that's going to come to trial. Uh, and, and we're going to see how this works out, right? But we're seeing this slow, slow trickle of Tesla cases where, where the position is Tesla says it's all on the driver and the criminal justice system currently agrees. And for robo-taxis, it hasn't been tested yet. Right. So that pedestrian dragging uh, mishap, this is the one in San Francisco where a cruise robo taxi. And I've I have a detailed paper out on this for anyone who wants to really know what really happened. We can put a link in the description. Yeah, we can put a link in the description. I have a I have a detailed one. And by the time this this description comes out, I have a a more general, more readable version without all the rigorous academic sites. That's easier to read. Uh, But but the short version is we can have an interesting discussion about whether the initial collision with a pedestrian could have been avoided because the pedestrian was first hurt by another car, hit by another car, and then went into the path path of the cruise robot taxi and the cruise robot taxi came to a stop. Uh, There's a lot of nuance there, might have been avoided, but let's just set that aside. After the cruise robot taxi had come to a complete stop, actually not even complete stop, again, details, but after it had stopped, you know, hit zero miles per hour, okay, It immediately, and I say not complete because it was still swaying on the suspension, it immediately decided to start moving again and drag the poor woman down the street. And the the report is very clear that a human driver would not have done that because they would have noticed they just hit a pedestrian and not moved the car until they figured out where the pedestrian was that they couldn't see anymore. It was under the car because because the front wheel went over the pedestrian, so they would have felt it, right? There's no way on earth that any reasonable human driver would have moved that car after the first impact. Okay. Completely agree. I mean, maybe, right. yeah, reasonable. I uh, think the, being the reasonable. Well, no, but reasonable yeah. is what we care about. Right. Yeah. And so anyone, if you run over a pedestrian, like they go under your front wheel and then you decide after the car comes to a stop to start driving again for any reason whatsoever, I don't care what the reason is. Right. Yeah. Um, You're probably intoxicated or, so or, or otherwise you're, not fit to you're, drive. You know, yeah. There's got to be one heck of a reason, right? You know, yeah. We're not talking about oncoming train about to hit your car. We're not talking about any of that stuff. There's right? somebody chasing you with a machine yeah, gun. We're, <laughs> we're not talking about any you know, the crazy yeah. stuff. It's just you're in yeah. the middle of the road. Nothing's going on. Yeah, yeah, if you agreed, decide to agreed. move your car, then that doesn't sound like reasonable driver behavior to me. Yeah, I concur. All right. So given that you know, until a court finds it, it's not a proven fact, but let, let's go with that, okay? It's not reasonable to move your car after you hit someone. Especially, especially if you don't know where they are, and there's really good reason to believe they're under your car, like like literally under your car. Okay, so this thing drags you down the street, 20 feet, seven miles an hour, max speed, uh, and eventually stops, but it doesn't actually stop because it knows there's a person. It stops because the wheels are spinning on the person. Okay, so this is this is pretty bad stuff. Wow. Now, where how does this come into to our definition of safety? Well, I think it would be reasonable if this ever got to a courtroom to expect the jury to say that was negligent driving, shouldn't have done it. All right. Uh, and that isn't necessarily a violation of red rule that gets sort of interesting, but it's just like a reasonable driver isn't going to do that. Okay. So let's say a jury found that was negligent driving. First of all, that's another constraint on safety as we were talking about, but this is a real, real one that's already happened. But the second one that's interesting is computer drivers do not have an obligation. They do not have a duty of care. The law does not give computer drivers a duty of care to the safety of the other road users. Oh, that's interesting. So there's no legal obligation to actually behave safely for these computer drivers. 
in well, that narrow sense. I mean, it. I almost wonder if you want to even define computer driver in that case, because is that just cruise control? Like, at what point? Well, so so that's why I call for these papers with this lawyer to deal with that. That's exactly what we did. Um, where this ends up is now General Motors has admitted in a separate court case with the motorcyclists that they actually have a duty of care, but that's because they admitted it in another court case. And even then, who knows if that admission will hold up in the next lawsuit. Now, we're never for the pedestrian dragging mishap. We're never going to find out because they just settled for for eight to twelve million dollars that just came out. Um, so so that'll never go to court. We won't find out. Yeah. But there will be a next mishap. And so one of the questions is, do these things, these computer drivers actually have a duty of care? And and it sort of has to turn out that way, but the industry has spent gobs of money lobbying to make it hard to end up there. There are some states in which the owner is responsible, not the manufacturer. Got it. And that's a state law the manufacturer has pushed for. And there are some states in which the computer is responsible for traffic violations instead of the manufacturer. And again, this, the company's pushed for this law. This is all industry lobbying happening. And I've been in some of these hearings. I've testified in some of these state uh, hearings and been to other things that, that this is what the manufacturers want because it makes it hard for anyone to go after the manufacturers. And how do you hold a computer accountable? Well, yeah. I mean, do you throw the computer into a jail cell and then put in another one? I, you know, I don't get it, right? So what can you do with computer drivers? And it's interesting. You're the one who said computer driver first in this discussion, which is very cool because I don't usually I'm the one who has to explain all that. But hopefully it's, you know, it's it's a computer. I prop I would propose it's anything that steers the car on a sustained basis. Interesting. Which includes autopilot, by the way. I, I get that. But it's because we've known since the 90s that people stop paying attention once the car steers itself. Yeah, makes sense. OK, but whether or not you want to draw the line there or you want to draw the line at robotaxi, let's sort of set that aside, different, different discussion. Are you citing no hands across America for the 90s or something different that was? Uh, you, you know, actually, as part of the automated highway system, there was a bunch of research saying that people stop paying attention when you take away steering. Oh, that's interesting. I remember going to conferences where, where people gave that talk back in the back in the late 90s. OK, that's fascinating. So, yes, all the way back to no hands across America. Actually, it was automated highway, which is right after that. Um, yes, yes, we've known forever. If you take away steering, people stop paying attention. So I want to draw the line there. But if you want to drive the line at RoboTaxi, however you want to find that, uh, fine. Not district discussion. Okay, so acceleration control doesn't count, like adaptive cruise. Yeah, because cruise, we know you still, not, you still pay attention. Not a computer driver, yeah. But yeah. but lane change assist, lane keeping. Assist. No, lane centering, lane centering. Yeah. Right. But, but whether you want to believe me on lane centering or not, because there's going to be a lot of people who don't want to hear that, uh, let's move on. Because <laughs> the point is, there's this thing called a computer driver, and it has something to do with car driving itself so much that the humans no longer are really paying attention sure. or, or not even there, right? And I'm going to accept the premise that it's you know lane centering. Yeah, accept that change. premise, but a different discussion. Okay, yeah, and that's another enough. podcast. We, we, yeah, we, we do it another time. <laughs> okay. Uh, but if you have a robo-taxi, clearly that's a computer driver, and it happens to also be steering. And so what we say is, you know, in all the traffic laws and all the court cases where it says a driver has a duty of care, guess what? Computer driver's driver. Part one. Okay? That's it. Just like e-signature is a signature, computer driver's a driver. Right? Yeah. So now we don't have to write, not write new laws. We just have to say, oh, yeah, computer driver's driver. Now that you have this other problem that if driver's not, computer driver's not a person, as you pointed out, right? Putting in jail doesn't make, doesn't really do anything useful. All right, so there's, that's, there was part one is computer driver's driver. Part two is the manufacturer is responsible for the behavior of the computer driver. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Just like a parent is responsible for the behavior of their child. Yeah. Again, invoking a known legal principle. Yeah, that makes sense. That's so it. You get to if the, you do that, well, if you do that, then computer drivers have a duty of care. And if they violate the duty of care, the manufacturer is held responsible. You still get to the definition of manufacturer, but I, to, to your point, that's another conversation. So. Yes, yeah, another conversation, but it, it's it's pretty simple, and you have to make some choices, but they're easy choices. Do you want it to be the system integrator, or do you want to be the company that last touched the code? Pick one, and we're done. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I would almost say it depends on the failure mode, but then you know, no courts can. No, really no, no, but that. You, yeah, the poor just victim shouldn't one. have to litigate that. Yeah. You know, just pick one. I I would say. Um, the person who last touched the code is more more direct, yeah. but system integrator is probably easier to implement. Yeah. And the reality is- I'm sure the OEMs would like that better too. <laughs> so. 
Well, the, 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 the victim needs a single point of contact that they don't have to spend. They don't have to sue 20 people to figure out who ends up holding the football in this particular set of facts. Yeah. Uh, and, and the manufacturers are are already proficient at dealing with their supplier made a mistake, but the, their name's on the car. So it's just sort of how things already work. So I would say the OEM. Well, I guess from an incentive structure, too. I mean, if, if yeah, you know, the person that's, you know, peer reviewing someone else's code knows that they're now the person who last touched the code, they're going to pay very close attention. Yeah. To- well, and the manufacturer then has incentive to force their suppliers to follow industry safety standards and things like this. So I think I would prefer it to be the manufacturer because I think it sets up the incentives the best way. And if the manufacturer says, no, really, it wasn't our fault, well, they can settle that with the supplier. The poor victim recovering the hospital shouldn't have to sort all that out. Let the manufacturer deal with that. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, now, now we back to our previous discussion about criminal penalties for companies. All that still applies, right? Uh, but mostly, we haven't really gone into criminal too much. We've been staying with tort law, and the tort law is hey, I was hurt so much that the insurance maximum doesn't cover it. I want the ability to sue to recover more because I have a just I have a justifiable reason for that. And they sue the manufacturer, and, and it's clear the manufacturer's on the hook. They don't have to get a state law ruled unconstitutional to earn the right to sue the manufacturer, which is where we are now. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And again, I'm not saying perfection. It was like, oh, you want to be perfect? No, I never said that. I said, hold them to the same standards we hold, hold humans. You want to get rid of the humans. Why would you make it? Why would you let these uh, these robot, robot whatever drivers, operators, why would you let these things behave in a way we would never tolerate from human? Makes no sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So now we circle all the way back to why I need to redefine safety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the heuristic of looking at negligence like before statistical, you know, incidents of bad outcomes. I mean, it, to me, that's my biggest takeaway from this conversation of, you know, like here's another way to look at it is just don't be negligent first. And then after mm-hmm. that, you know, be safer in terms of right. statistical outcomes. Well, it wouldn't be safer. It would be then reduce incident incident uh, of incidents. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase yeah, so it. So there, well, that's right. So you, you you just can't really be negligent now. Now, will it happen just because nothing's perfect on an occasion? Yeah, sure, but it's not something you want to design for. It's not okay to say, I I think I'm going to be negligent because it reduces net risk. That that's not an okay trade off. Yeah. That's. I almost feel like you're getting yourself into like a trolley problem sort of situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that that could happen. Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe we talk about that on the next segment. The whole sure because this this puts you in a in a certain place, uh, and I think maybe we we could have another segment that talks about now that I've made this point. What are you going to do to fix it? How are you going to address it? Yeah, I think that'd be interesting. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.